We have already discussed the importance of paying attention to how media technologies are powerful when they are ordinary and relatively invisible, when they work like appliances in our everyday life. This was the key message of McLuhan's media theory, as well as theories of media domestication. But these perspectives tend to imagine media technologies individually. The television, the radio, the smart home assistant. They rely on an image of artifacts showing up in our home or office, user-friendly things which extend our contact with others or provide us with certain experiences. We sometimes ignore these domesticated artifacts and things, but we almost always ignore what lies below or beyond, the vast, dispersed infrastructures on which these media technologies depend. Media Technology and Culture is a podcast series by me, Scott Rogers. In this series, we'll be taking a thematic look at media, understood as technologies. We'll explore the histories of media, as well as more recent developments, and not always necessarily in a linear progression. Some of you listeners will be students in my module, Media Technology and Culture, in which we'll discuss and work on some of these themes in more detail. This is the sixth episode in our series, focused on infrastructural technologies, in which we'll consider media technologies as large-scale infrastructures. If we were to push the boundaries, we could point to all kinds of infrastructural dependencies related to media. Electrical power, water networks, or the mining of rare metals. We will focus, however, on the internet as itself a technological infrastructure. This is perhaps the only case where it might make sense to refer to the internet as a proper noun with the capitalized I. The key idea I want to get across is this. We are schooled to ignore media as large-scale infrastructures, yet we do so at our peril. Infrastructures such as the internet are not only the focus of many political and economic struggles, they are also increasingly acknowledged as rather fragile. One useful way to start thinking about media infrastructures is as the physical basis of apparently wireless communication. Media scholar Lisa Parks calls this the stuff you can kick. Recall our discussion in episode two of James Carey's 1989 essay on the telegraph. Yes, the telegraph made it possible to conceive of communication without transportation, but this was only possible because of a vast backdrop of physical infrastructures. Telegraph wires needed to be laid, And often, this was right alongside railways, a transportation infrastructure with which the telegraph was arguably in a symbiotic relationship. Nicole Starosilski's 2015 book, The Undersea Network, points out that the apparent wirelessness of various media is grounded by masses of cables. This is the case with the internet, built in part on a historically long-standing and still-growing network of undersea cables. Undersea cables have recently drawn attention, not just because they're so important, but because they are remarkably exposed. They can be easily compromised, intentionally or by accident, cutting off the internet for entire world regions. But Starosilski also suggests that undersea cables provide a fourfold lens that highlights how and why studying the physical infrastructures underlying media is useful. First, they are a resource for mediation. Media of all forms are built on the back of these infrastructures. For example, London's preeminence in film and television rests in part on how small Soho post-production houses have collectively bought up and leased the unused dark fiber connecting London's financial services sector, giving them access to international data transfer at speeds of 10 gigabytes per second. Second, infrastructures highlight media temporality. We're already familiar with how the telegraph shifted perceptions of time, and how, today, the growth of high-frequency trading depends on the construction of ambitious, astoundingly expensive, and slightly straighter fiber connections. You might ask, why spend all this money on cabling? Isn't it faster to go by satellite? The answer is no. Physical fiber optic cabling remains about eight times faster than satellite transfer. And because it enables near instantaneous data transfer, localities, even specific buildings can derive a time advantage from location. Third, they are possible sites of media disruption. The location specificity of media infrastructures brings vulnerability. 
a localized accident or a localized conflict can expose the fundamental connectivity of an area. But it is also about control. In certain geographical contexts, for example, it is often faster and cheaper to route internet connections through another country. Much of local Sao Paulo internet traffic is routed through Miami. More than 80% of African and Middle Eastern traffic is routed through Europe. So there are issues of dependency, exposure to external monitoring, not to mention the whims of foreign telecommunications regulation. Finally, infrastructures index forms of media inequality. It should already be obvious that where infrastructure is concentrated or the routes it takes creates geographical inequalities. But the nature of media infrastructure can also create inequalities between different forms of communication. The widespread construction of telegraph infrastructures had the relatively sudden effect of rendering audiovisual forms of communication slow. Such communication could not be encoded via the telegraph, and it led to a relatively long period in which speed was associated with textual information. Many recent discussions of digital platforms have centered on these sorts of infrastructural questions. Now, we know the public face of Google. It's, for example, its search engine, its content aggregation, its advertising and cloud services. But at its core, Google is arguably an engineering company. Its internally iconic locations are its enormous data centers, with cables distinguished using the Google colors. But it's not just that platforms like Google or Facebook depend on physical infrastructures. Some would argue we should see platforms as infrastructures in their own right. This is the argument put forward by Jean-Christophe Plantin and others in a 2018 article in the journal New Media and Society. They point out that digital platforms derive value by reorganizing a wide range of infrastructures external to the platform. So for example, Airbnb makes money from organizing residential property it does not itself own. But in that process, it can itself become an infrastructure, coordinating an increasingly large part of the local real estate market. Seeing digital platforms as infrastructures in their own right implies a slightly broader sense of media as infrastructure, one where, as John Durham Peters put it in his 2015 book, The Marvelous Clouds, media infrastructures can be lightweight and portable as well as heavy and fixed. Thinking about infrastructures as both lightweight and portable as well as heavy and fixed may at first seem a little confusing. What is important to know is that scholars have tended to study infrastructure in two different, though often overlapping, ways. Plantin and his co-authors do a good job at summarizing these. The first largely resembles how we've been discussing infrastructures so far, as large-scale systems. This means studying infrastructures in terms of their material and technical makeup, how they have developed and evolved historically. A second approach, however, examines the phenomenology of infrastructure. This means thinking about how we experience, and perhaps most crucially, come to depend on infrastructures within our routines, whether in everyday or organizational life. Let's consider these two ways of studying infrastructure through an example not directly related to media, the unexciting wooden pallet. In February 2019, it emerged that after Brexit, the United Kingdom may not have enough wooden pallets of the correct pest control standard and specification needed to move the commodities it needs into and out of the European Union. While countries inside the EU are exempt from strict regulations around the treatment of pallets, with the UK outside of the EU, the approximately 100 million pallets used for EU-UK trade now need to conform to a standard called ISPM 15. The first approach we've outlined might think about this dilemma as one of technical infrastructure. A question, in other words, about the materiality or physicality of wooden pallets as stuff you can kick. Ensuring that the wooden pallets verifiably meet the correct technical specification in their physical composition might be what the sociologist Michel Callan would call an obligatory passage point. ISPM 15 pallets are like the narrow point of a funnel through which a much larger network of goods and commodities must fit. The second, more phenomenological approach would be to ask how it was that this issue of well-known pallet standards remained relatively hidden from view in the first place. One possible reason, famously suggested by the late science and technology scholar Susan Lee Starr, is that infrastructures are, quote, boring and singularly unexciting. 
they appear as lists of numbers and technical specifications, or as hidden mechanisms subtending those processes more familiar to social scientists. End quote. In the past, the standards of pallets had perhaps become somewhat invisible, relatively indistinguishable, woven into the practical routines and rules governing logistics systems relating to goods distribution. Both of these perspectives tell us something about wooden pallets as an infrastructure. They also point to two corresponding frames for thinking about the politics of infrastructure. These are well captured by Paul Durish and Genevieve Bell in their 2011 book, Divining a Digital Future. Seeing infrastructures as large-scale technical systems tends to lead to a socio-political emphasis, focusing on how infrastructures crystallize institutional relations. This entails a focus on how access to and control of infrastructures reflects concentrations of power. But approaches that examine the phenomenology of infrastructure tend to lead to an experiential emphasis, focusing, quote, not so much on how infrastructures reflect institutional relationships, but more on how they shape individual actions, end quote. Here, infrastructures are political both in how they often subtly shape our perceptions of the world, but also in how they often expose our everyday dependencies, particularly when they unexpectedly break down. CBS Television presents a special report on Sputnik 1, the Soviet space satellite. Douglas Edwards reporting. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. Let's retell a story, one that will be familiar, even cliched, for internet historians. On 4th of October, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the world's first Earth-orbiting satellite. Not only did this unanticipated event inaugurate the so-called space race, but also an era of intense competition in scientific research and development. Just four months after news emerged of Sputnik 1, and in direct response to the event, U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower founded a new Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, later renamed the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. This agency was, amongst other things, tasked with preventing more surprises like Sputnik 1. It was intended to mobilize the United States' dispersed military, industrial, and academic expertise and resources. By 1966, ARPA had begun a new project, very much in this vein, with the objective of connecting remote computers to allow for the sharing of information and data processing. By 1969, the new ARPA network, or ARPANET, connected computers at UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, University of Utah, and the Stanford Research Institute. ARPANET was the world's first operational, wide-area, packet-switching network. What is packet switching? Well, it might be easiest to explain by contrasting it with another form of networking, circuit switching. Imagine you're using your mobile phone and making a call using the minutes in your monthly cellular plan. When you do this, you pay by the minute, regardless of how much speaking there is, which is to say, regardless of the amount of data transferred. This is circuit switching, where you are using a pre-allocated bandwidth for data transfer within a dedicated communication session. Packet switching is different, and would apply if, for example, you made the same call using WhatsApp. Here, the same voice data would be broken down, chunked up, disassembled, and transmitted as packets. Each of these packets may be differently routed across network connections before being reassembled at the other end. In the process, your data might well have been shared with other packets coming from and or destined to other users. If you pay for this data at all, it would be in relation to the amount of data units rather than the duration of the connection. ARPANET grew slowly. For many years, it was largely confined to the United States, partly because universities needed federal funding to join the network. In the 1970s, however, DARPA enlisted computer scientists Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn to develop new protocols for what was described as internetworking. These new protocols would be rules allowing communication between dispersed computer networks, which might be based on different types of technology. Drawing on concepts developed for the French Cyclade project, developed by Louis Pouzon, Cerf and Kahn eventually developed what is now called the Internet Protocol Suite. The most well-known constituents of this suite are Internet Protocol, or IP, and Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP. Leaving aside their precise technical details, 
What is important to understand is that TCP and IP are shared standards. They are not singular, heavy and fixed infrastructures, but rather one that is multiple, lightweight and portable. An infrastructure that led to ARPANET's semi-privatization in 1983 and its eventual decommissioning in 1990, making way for the internet we know today, a network of networks. This story about the internet we know today is not a fictional one. It is historically verifiable, but it is not the whole story. For one, there's a gloss here that might make the inception of the internet sound like a fully rational, strategically realized project of the US military. This would be misleading. Manuel Castells in his 2001 book, The Internet Galaxy, points out how, while ARPANET was justified as a way to share computing time and thereby mobilize knowledge for ostensive military advantage, it was very quickly commandeered by computer scientists who were much more interested in experimenting with interactive computing. It is also, however, that this story, which is the conventional story, overemphasizes ARPANET, as well as its evolution into the specificities of a TCP IP mediated network of networks. In recent years, the media historian Lori Emerson has, for example, undertaken detailed research under the banner of other networks considering the computer networks that preceded or ran outside of the internet. Attention to such other networks shines light on the parallel grassroots traditions of network computing. This includes, for example, community bulletin board systems, which did not initially use packet switching, but rather dial-up modems, or the precursor community memory project, which was a kind of public BBS with hardwired terminals connected to a mainframe computer spread across the San Francisco Bay Area in the 1970s. After inserting a coin, its users would enter public messages, primarily related to buy and sell activities, though some users experimented in other ways, such as with poetry. Amongst other things, these experimental, smaller scale, and sometimes slower networks were a crucial locus for the open source do-it-yourself ethic, marking much of today's digital design community. Votre Minitel se branche très facilement. The Minitel network is another example of a network beyond the internet, sustained for more than 30 years by the French government and industry. It allowed for digitized information to be sent over telephone lines to terminals loaned to home users who could make online purchases, railway reservations, and search the telephone directory. Even in its final years, before its retirement in 2012, France Telecom reported that the service was still receiving up to 10 million connections a month. C'était très facile. There is another elephant in the room. The development of the World Wide Web and early browsers such as Mosaic and Netscape in the 1990s. It is arguably the web that was the watershed medium through which ordinary people, the public at large, could take advantage of the internet to access and use millions of documents and resources in their everyday life. So important was the web that, in practice, it has often been conflated with the internet. But the web is not the internet, and there are important reasons for us to make this distinction. Even in 2001, Manuel Castells was keen to emphasize the internet as a background infrastructure, a fabric. Drawing a not-so-subtle parallel with McLuhan, he claimed that the network is the message. Castells argued that the internet is akin to electricity's importance for industrialization and, like electricity, something we generally don't encounter firsthand, but through other mediums. Mediums or protocols that depend on internet infrastructure today include the web, email, file sharing and storage services, instant messaging apps, voice and video conferencing, cloud-based software, social networking services, and massively multiplayer online games. But increasingly, the internet is an infrastructure supporting even more than all this. Laura Donardis, a well-known scholar of internet governance, has specifically focused her research on the policy and regulatory implications of the internet as a technical infrastructure. In her 2020 book, The Internet in Everything, she turns her attention to what it means to think about internet governance and security when the internet has evolved from a communication to a control network. That is, from a network primarily connecting people facing display screens to one connecting objects and artifacts. Imagine you're at work and realize that you might not have turned off the air conditioner while leaving your house. 
Instead of traveling all the way back home, what if you could use your smartphone to know the The internet of isn't just about computers anymore. Now, all kinds of everyday objects can connect to the internet, including cars, thermostats, sporting equipment, refrigerators, and even smart shoes. Appliances, smart cars, smart homes, smart cities, where IoT is redefined. We're talking about a world blanketed with billions of sensors. These sensors are taking information from real physical objects that are in the world and uploading it to the internet. Okay, so connecting things to the internet, big deal, right? Well, it kind of is, and here's why. Because things can start to share their experiences with other things. Whoa, wait, what? <laughs> How's that tools. work, right? But when our tools start talking back, the loop will be finished. We will have fully spread our minds out into our universe. This is the Internet of Things. This is why it's a game changer. And this is why it absolutely rattles my imagination. So, you know, read up on it, right? It's coming. If you do an online search for the term Internet of Things, you will be returned a cavalcade of videos and websites. They will range from the explanatory to the breathlessly prophetic, from the analytical to the blatantly commercial. As Donardus points out, this supposed future, where the internet connects not only people but physical objects, is actually already here. The internet has already reached a point where internet-connected devices outnumber human users. In 2020, there were at least four such devices for every person on Earth. Market research firm IHS Market predicts 125 billion such devices by 2030. These internet-connected devices are more than just the portable media we carry around with us, such as smartphones. They include a growing range of consumer electronics, such as fridges, toasters, and lighting. Also, local infrastructures such as traffic lights, street lighting, water meters, or car park payment systems. Industrial logistics increasingly depends on sensors, tracking chips, and remote-controlled robotics. Internet-connected devices such as defibrillators are even being implanted into our bodies. For some time, still today, people have happily spoken of being on the internet. But this is increasingly an anachronism. As Donardus argues, screens can no longer be the final or even the main arbiter of being online or offline. With the rise of cyber-physical systems, which is Donardus' preferred term rather than Internet of Things, we are seeing a new phenomenological condition, she says, in which, precisely as it expands, the internet is receding more and more from our perception. Amongst other things, this complicates what it means to talk about internet users. Not just who or what internet users are, but how internet use unfolds. Use becomes not only the interaction of eyes, ears, or digits in relation to a display screen, it also includes sensors collecting data from, and actuators modulating and acting in, the worlds we inhabit. Hello there, what are you doing? Hey, what, what, hey, what, sorry? What are you doing with your life? I'm from the government, why not retrain for cyber? Cyber, what's, what's that? What's cyber? It's cybering. Right, the... You've just turned it into a verb. I still, I, just, I still don't know what it means. October 2020 saw a whole series of mimetic responses to the UK government's Rethink, Reskill, Reboot campaign, which aimed to encourage people to retrain for jobs in the cyber sector. Largely, these responses reacted to an ad showing Fatima, a ballet dancer who, it is suggested, could move into a new career in cyber, even if she doesn't know it yet. These ads were rightly attacked for their unsubtle devaluing of the arts, but they were also derided because of the seeming obscurity of a job in cyber, such as the TikTok clip you just heard from British comedian Michael Spicer. I mean, is cyber even a thing? Deserve jokes aside, for internet scholars like Laura Donardis, cyber, specifically cybersecurity, is very definitely a thing. Paying attention to the internet as infrastructure, whether one connecting people or things, raises some critical questions about security, freedom, and power. We depend on the internet today for all manner of public information, and yet it is an infrastructure that is largely owned and even regulated by various private companies. These privately controlled infrastructures are also very fragile, and various attempts to co-opt them towards political, legal, or social ends may further undermine their stability and security. 
The proposed and never enacted U.S. Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA, is one example where internet infrastructures might have been co-opted to enforce intellectual property rights. It would have used the domain name system, or DNS, to either restrict an offending individual's access to a particular domain, or to seize or disable an offending domain. The SOPA Act created a marked juxtaposition between opposing U.S. and global media brands and organizations. On one side, companies like Disney and Time Warner, alongside the Motion Picture Association of America and Recording Industry Association of America, together sought to protect intellectual property, copyright, and creator royalties. On the other, platforms such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Wikipedia, together sought to defend the internet as a free and stable architecture for their brand of open-ended innovation. U.S.-focused debates about net neutrality embody a different infrastructural co-opting. At issue with net neutrality is the desire of some large-scale internet service providers to be able to prioritize traffic. Critics call this a two-speed internet, akin to giving people two levels of electrical current. It might allow a company such as Netflix to have its streaming content prioritized over your personal blog. The demands of streaming on internet infrastructure are considerable. In spring 2020, both Netflix and Disney agreed to temporarily lower their bit rates in Europe, so as to avoid an internet overload brought on by the sudden shift to home working during the pandemic. We might observe here this central place of U.S. media, old and new, in shaping internet infrastructure. Maneuvers made in Washington, D.C. around internet regulation have potentially global implications. You are hearing protesters in Myanmar marching in February 2021 against a government coup and also a nationwide internet shutdown. This points to another way in which internet infrastructure has been co-opted politically via what Donardis in a 2012 article in the journal Information, Communication and Society calls the kill switch. This is where internet infrastructure is partly or entirely shut down. For example, the government of Iran blocking YouTube after its 2009 elections, or Instagram and Telegram in response to 2017 protests, or Sri Lanka blocking Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp after suicide bombings in 2019, or even network-wide shutdowns such as by Egypt in 2011, Iran in 2019, or Myanmar in 2021. This kill switch has been flipped outside of authoritarian regimes. In 2011, the Bay Area Rapid Transit Authority, or BART, police shut down mobile services within the San Francisco Bay Area metro system to preempt a protest against a BART police shooting of a black homeless man. British Transport Police did the same thing with London Underground in 2019 in an effort to quell an Extinction Rebellion protest. The case of WikiLeaks, Donardus notes, presents a related yet distinct example. Here, in the aftermath of the Cablegate saga, with debates raging about content-related issues such as the relative importance of diplomatic secrecy versus freedom of information, a technical infrastructure war was also being waged. Private payment processing companies such as MasterCard and PayPal, for example, cut off financial services to WikiLeaks. In response, the loosely affiliated hacker collective Anonymous hit these companies with a Distributed Denial of Service, or DDoS, attack flooding the websites with so many automated requests that they crashed under the volume. Not only does this example illustrate that the kill switch is available to private companies, but also, potentially, to oppositional movements. Speaking of WikiLeaks, in 2017, it published more than 8,000 documents from the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, which revealed how internet infrastructures might be used as a form of remote control. The CIA has apparently explored, for example, remotely switching mobile phones on and off, thereby installing software to track a user's location, reveal their messages, or tap into the device's mic or camera. Similar software was explored for smart televisions to effectively turn them into listening devices, operable even when they are apparently switched off. Hacking into cars, which are more and more loaded with network software, was also investigated, possibly, according to WikiLeaks journalists, to perform a surreptitious assassination. Perhaps these are examples of the domestication of technology striking back? If we see an incursion into our personal identities, for example through email or social media, we are quite likely to close ranks. But with objects collecting data from our own personal spaces, we seem conditioned to be much more indifferent. 
The growth of internet infrastructures presents us with another pressing political issue, climate change. Remember earlier, I noted how we know the public face of Google well in terms of its search engine, etc., but often forget about its material infrastructures. Well, data processing by a company like Google generates a lot of heat. This is one of the reasons why data centers are often located in remote, colder locations. But wherever these facilities lie, they use millions of gallons of water daily for their cooling. Their electricity requirements are also considerable. To get a real impression of these impacts, take a look at the work of Joanna Mole, a European artist whose fascinating work centers in large part on the materiality of the internet. Her 2014 net installation, co 2 Google, shows visitors a real-time approximation of the CO2 emitted by visits to Google.com. I found it more than a little distressing seeing the emissions tally rise so precipitously, about 500 kilograms a second. We need not single out Google here, though. The impact is across all kinds of digital platforms. A recent Cambridge University study estimated that the data processing needs of Bitcoin mining requires more energy than Argentina, population 45 million. Researchers at the University of Glasgow and University of Oslo have reported that music streaming has a far worse carbon footprint than physical formats, despite dispensing with all of that plastic. Across the board, it is estimated that data centers emit as much CO2 as the commercial airline industry. So much for the supposedly lower environmental impact of all that remote working during the pandemic. The politics at play here, at least for internet governance scholars, is about power over and control of internet infrastructures. But remember, there are different ways of looking at the politics of media infrastructures. Alexander Galloway's 2004 book Protocol, for example, draws on Gilles Deleuze's 1992 essay on societies of control to argue that while the internet seems to operate without centralized command structures or hierarchies, it does not promise the disappearance of control altogether. Galloway argues that in networks, control is exerted not by central command, but by distributed protocols. Here, freedom itself can be a mode of control. Think about our ambiguous relationship with so many different internet-based platforms, from email to Facebook. Yes, they afford new ways to communicate and associate relatively freely, but their very existence also places new expectations on us, collectively, that we will communicate or share information. This would entail thinking more about the politics of infrastructural experience and dependency, rather than just socio-political control, a distinction we made earlier drawing on the work of Paul Durish and Genevieve Bell. We will expand on this experiential emphasis in our next episode on ubiquitous technologies, So, until then, I'm Scott Rogers, and you've been listening to Media, Technology, and Culture.